Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Gil Singletary. I'm the Senior Director here at Chamberlain University. Allow me to first start by saying it is indeed an honor to facilitate this discussion surrounding this very, very important topic. Over the past few months, the headlines have been dominated by the worst pandemics in modern history. And if you're wondering why I use the word pandemics with an S, it's because America is in the midst of balancing both a public health and a racial pandemic. Often, we think of the two as being separate. However, in actuality, the two are one and the same. Social and racial inequalities sit at the intersection of public health and are directly related to health disparities and overall life satisfaction. By now, we have all are familiar with the names George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and more recently, Jacob Blake. We've seen the images of their deaths and our encounters with broadcasted throughout television and social media. And we've seen the protests and riots pour over into the streets. However, despite the ongoing quest for justice and our search for answers, critical questions remain unanswered. For example, how will the images of violence and trauma impact the lives of children decades from now? And how might the images of law enforcement engaged in deadly encounters with black and brown individuals impact the psychological disposition of these marginalized groups? To provide answers to these complex questions, I'm joined today by a very distinguished panel of experts who will further the discussion by sharing experiences in various areas relating to, the, to trauma, adolescence, and child development, community health, and law enforcement. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce members of this very distinguished panel. First on the panel is Dr. Karen Cox. Many of you may know Dr. Cox as the president of Chamber University. However, many of you may not be aware that Dr. Cox is also a distinguished scholar and practitioner with many years of experience in pediatric nursing and child development. Prior to joining Chamberlain, Dr. Cox served as the executive vice president and chief operating officer of Children's Mercy Medical Center. Dr. Cox has presented at many conferences and published numerous research and peer review articles in a range of subjects and discipline. I can go on for days about Dr. Cox's accomplishments. However, I would just conclude by saying that Dr. Cox is the former president of the American Academy of Nursing, and she's a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives. It goes without saying, we are grateful to have Dr. Cox as our president and leader of Chamberlain University. It is such an asset and such a pleasure to have someone who is both an academic and practitioner. Next on the panel is Dr. Keanu Battle. Dr. Battle is an assistant professor in the MSW program here at Chamberlain University. She has served as a school social worker for over a decade in both New York Georgia, and Georgia public schools. Dr. Battle, Dr. Battle has also served as the director of services for the Georgia Department of Corrections. Great. Her passion for serving others through a trauma-informed approach is evident through both her professional and personal experiences. Dr. Battle is the co-author of Real Girls Shifting Perceptions on Identity, Relationships, and the Media, and Real Girls Reflection and Grief. Why me? Why Not Me? A Journey of Self-Discovery. She has also completed research in the areas of grief counseling, support groups for children and adolescents. Dr. Battle has been a, been a featured presenter at several national conferences, including National Youth at Risk Conference and the National Association for Social Workers. Next on the panel is Dr. Rob Davis. Dr. Davis is, is currently Associate Professor of Nursing in the MSN Nursing Executive Track at Chamberlain University. Prior to his faculty role, he served as director of the DNP program and senior director of online operations at Chamberlain University. Dr. Davis has served in numerous senior leadership positions in universities and colleges of nursing prior to coming to Chamberlain in 2012. Nursing is a second career for Dr. Davis. Prior to his nursing career, he was a sheriff deputy in Lexington County, South Carolina, where he served in the patrol, traffic, canine, narcotics, and vice and dare divisions of the department. He currently works as a part-time patrol officer for a small township in Northeast Ohio. Rob Kern's areas of interest involve bringing his nursing and law enforcement backgrounds together to better serve the community. Rob is an EMT and teaches police, fire, and search and rescue personnel, wilderness, and tactical medicine. He also teaches law enforcement and EMS personnel how to work together to more quickly respond and render aid to victims in mass casualty situations. Last but not the least on this distinguished panel, is Dr. Demetrius Hogan. Dr. Hogan is an assistant professor in the College of Nursing here at Chamber University. She has been a faculty member since 2011, 
Her research interests in, include areas of pediatrics and community health. She has collaborated with others in the field of community services. She has over 20 years of bedside nursing and pediatrics experience, including hospitals, clinics, and home health. Dr. Hogan is an active member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated and volunteers with many children organizations such as Boy Scouts of America. She serves as a member on the EDGE Executive Board for At Talum Global Education. Demetria serves as a faculty liaison for the Student Nurse Association and Sigma Theta Tha International. Whew. What a distinguished panel. Moving to our first question. By now we've all seen the videos of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and many other African-Americans murdered and shared on social media and our television. However, the recent shootings of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin was different. Unlike the other tragedies that were also captured on camera, this particular event, in my opinion, was much more profound. Yes. It had an additional element with much greater significance. In addition to the millions of people who watched the video of Jacob Blake being shot in the back, his three kids, three, five, and eight, also witnessed the event. With all the focus surrounding on police and questions of racial and social justice, lost in the headlines were the impact of witnessing such traumatic events on the lives of children. Three, five, and eight. <clears throat> Experiences in childhood matter. Numerous research studies have shown how adverse childhood experiences impact child development and health outcomes. Dr. Cox, the question is for you. What exactly are adverse childhood experiences and how exactly do they impact child development? Thank you, Dr. Siegel Perry. First, adverse childhood events are really grouped into three categories, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And abuse, for example, is physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Neglect is physical and emotional. And under physical, I think of things like food insecurity, housing insecurity, and then household dysfunction, talking about mental illness in the home, substance abuse, the mother being treated violently, an incarcerated relative, or divorce. And what, why these are important is the result of these is toxic stress in childhood. And we know that if you have at least four or more of these things that are uh, occurred in your childhood, that you will have toxic stress. And that that toxic stress is going to cause you lifelong physical as well as emotional issues. I first wanna explain what toxic stress is real quickly. If you're driving really fast in your car, um, going down the highway, right over the speed limit, and you hit the brakes to avoid hitting someone, and your purse just goes flying into the front, F, the front seat into the floor, and you have that feeling in, the, in your chest for about maybe five seconds or less, but that your heart's beating quickly, you're scared, um, it's, it's just this uh, overwhelming sense of dread. And what happens is for children who experience childhood, uh, toxic stress in childhood, that is a feeling they have for uh, off and on throughout their day and throughout their life. And so you can imagine if you have that feeling in your chest for 20 minutes and you're in school, you're going to have trouble focusing. And the toxic stress, what it does is it changes the architecture of your brain. So it makes it harder for you to have solid, higher functioning decision-making, and it makes you have more of a focus on impulsivity, but not because of a, of a desire to do that, it's because of the physiology. And that biology of adversity is, is a really important thing for us to understand as we try to understand uh, the story of individuals and, and how, how that impact in their childhood got them to where they are as an adult. And I can say more about it, but I'll leave it there. Dr. Cox, quite fascinating. Just as a follow-up question, it sounds like what you were suggesting is that events that happen in one's childhood could then carry over to one's adulthood. Can you expand on that just briefly, please? Yes. So what happens is that that impact of that stress, the change in your brain architecture sets you up all throughout your life for physical and emotional problems. And the most interesting finding is that it's not just about your 
some people would think your mental health would suffer and it does, but you are much more likely to have heart disease, obesity, um, strokes, and it's not something that people realize. And so it's not, um, it's not always about a choice that people make. Sometimes it's about, about the experience they had in childhood, but it carries on. I think your comments are quite timely when you think about what we're hearing about COVID and the pre-existing conditions. It sounds like some of those things you were talking about could exacerbate some of those pre-existing conditions that we're now seeing more pronounced in COVID. Exactly. Wow. Thank you very much. Moving to our, our, our next question, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, the power of perception and, and self-image, as I think about um, Dr. Cox's example, it sort of makes me think about this whole notion of the experiences that we have as a child and how those experiences then impact the way that we view ourselves. And so it, I get my question is, our, our self-concept is so important because it influences how we think, how we feel and how we act. Um, you know, how you view yourself and how others view you is critical to how we engage with the outside world. Uh, in large parts, our perception becomes our reality. Uh, Dr. Davis, how do you think the images of black males dying while engaged with law enforcement will impact their self image and perception of law enforcement. And, and one more question, and what can we do from the perspective of law enforcement to improve those conditions? And I'll, I'll ask that question again, because I know it's a sort of a double barrel question. Um, how do you think the images of black males dying while engaged with law enforcement will impact their self image and perception of law enforcement? And what can we do from the perspective of law enforcement to improve those conditions? Well, thank you, Dr. Singletary. And you ask some very important questions and uh, you make a really important observation about perceptions. And I'm gonna focus on the perception because I think that's really a key here. So I agree with your observation that uh, perception plays a big role in shaping what one believes. And I think it's a good conversation to have. So when thinking about perception, you also have to ask uh, the question, how are perceptions formed? They're not just born with perceptions, they don't just appear. They, they develop as a result of things that we see uh, and hear, and those things shape our thoughts and attitudes toward a particular issue. So what we choose to take uh, in via entertainment media, news media, social media, uh, who we decide to listen to, uh, those can all influence and shape our perception of a, a particular issue. Uh, and once we have that perception set, uh, we tend to look at things through that lens and that's what makes it um, our perceived reality. So for the for the topic at hand and the question uh, that you posed to me on that particular um, area, uh, think about the media coverage of police interactions um, with black males, along with statements made by uh, prominent individuals that are given large blocks of time that are dedicated uh, to these particular uh, stories. So those images uh, and statements uh, both certainly can contribute to a number of perceptions and there's a, a number of prevailing perceptions and uh, two of them would be uh, one that uh, in black men should be fearful of police interactions and then there's a second uh, perception that is fairly pr uh, predominant that police uh, intentionally look for opportunities to um, uh, intentionally injure or kill black men so those perceptions whether they're based in fact or not uh, can easily lead to poor self-image uh, especially among children that are watching these, um, and an, uh, develop an antagonistic view uh, toward the police um, in current and future generations. So let's just quickly consider the uh, media coverage of these negative police interactions. So they're displayed on news media and social media, uh, print media, uh, run 24 seven so that these images are constantly in the minds of uh, those media uh, consumers. But how often is that balanced with accounts of positive police interactions? For instance, in 2019, a police academy colleague of mine uh, was the first person to arrive on the scene of a house that was fully en engulfed in flames. Uh, the first thing he saw when he rolled up there was a, a black woman crawling out of the front door. Uh, she was overcome with smoke. And all the, uh, all the woman could say as he ran up to her was, my son, my son, as she pointed into the house. And without hesitation, Josh rushed into the home, spent several minutes in there, located the child and pulled him to safety. So for every story of a police deadly encounter or a negative encounter with a member of the public, regardless of race, uh, there are hundreds of stories of police officers saving lives. Um, and I think if there is a more proportioned uh, portrayal uh, and balance of these type of stories, um, the qu question I have is would that, um, would that result in a change um, in perception and could that help? Uh, then you have 
commentary on, on those interactions by uh, prominent celebrities and people um, uh, people that uh, you respect um, and uh, have uh, you have trust in. So, for instance, in her uh, address to the Democrat National Convention several weeks ago, firm, uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama uh, named George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, uh, quote, a never-ending list of innocent people of color, uh, uh, end quote, who continue to be murdered. LeBron James, uh, speaking uh, speaking about uh, uh, the police officer that shot Jacob Blake, who you mentioned earlier, said, uh, I quote, or maybe he just left the house saying that today is going to be the day uh, for the end for one of these black people. So statements like that can, combined with the 24-7 uh, uh, media that uh, children and, and adults as well are watching help uh, shape those uh, perspectives. So, um, and then the second part of your question, just real, uh, real briefly, you know, what can, um, what can we do from a law enforcement perspective uh, to improve these conditions? So I, as a police officer, attended a 40 hour course um, called crisis intervention training, uh, facilitated by mental health individuals that included classroom and scenario training on how to deal with uh, people in, in crisis. Um, this is one area that's not mandated by most academies and is something that uh, would be very helpful for police officers um, in dealing with this. And it's been three years since I've taken that training and I've not received any training, uh, follow-up training with that. Whereas every year we're mandated to, to um, do follow-up training in a number of areas and skills uh, that we need to be proficient in, um, such as firearms training, defensive tactics, pursuit driving, things that we'll hopefully never have to use um, but we don't receive any mandated yearly training in how to deal with people um, in crisis. So those are just a, a few thoughts I had um, in response to your question, and I'll turn that back over to you, Dr. Singletary. Thank you, uh, Dr. Davis. And again, what, what makes these dialogues so rich is that we have such variance in perspectives, and I think that's what we're what sort of our intent here is to have different perspectives. And one of the things that sort of struck me when you were talking. Uh, was about the training that police officers uh, go through and the perception, as you mentioned, is perpetuated through the media. And it also brought me back to Dr. Cox's comments about uh, toxic stress. And, and so combining those two together, I'm thinking about perhaps maybe a 13-year-old African-American male who may think looking at the media that he is public enemy number one. And then being stuck in that perpetual state of, as Dr. Dr. Cox described, sort of this hyper vigilance, always feeling as if that you're on the edge. Um, it, it only just makes me just wonder how those things will then impact that same individual as they progress on throughout their life. Um, you mentioned about, you know, just how it's reinforced through the media, um, through prominent celebrities and, and others. Uh, and so it's almost as if we're, we're just can't escape it. Like it's, it's just everywhere. It's just ubiquitous. We're surrounded by it everywhere we go. Right. And so I, I imagine this, you know, a, a three, five and an eight year old who's trying to make sense of the world as, as we were talking about dealing with uh, the police is considered you know, our friend. And if you view the police as your enemy, I can only imagine what that must be like for that three, five or eight year old who's already dealing with toxic stress that are a function of their, uh, their environment. As we talk about those adverse childhood experiences, and then you put that on top of that, that, that to me seems almost like a boilerplate. That, that is a segue to our next question to Dr. Battle. In fact, um, Dr. Battle, Thus far, we've spoken a lot about trauma and the impact that it has on health outcomes. How do you define trauma and how can trauma negatively impact child development? Particularly as we talk about adverse childhood experiences and, and trauma, is, is, is there a correlation there? Are they related? But um, how does it impact um, adolescent uh, health outcomes? Well, Dr. Singletary, that's a great, a great question. And this conversation is so rich, um, just gleaning from my peers and colleagues who recently shared. When we talk about defining in its simplest form, it can be defined as a complex event or experience that overwhelms one's ability to cope. And so I love that you talked about, you know, we see what that can potentially do to an adult. But if we're talking about a child age three, age three, five, eight, and even an adolescent, we know just developmentally that children are still growing. They're still trying to navigate the world around them. 
And many of our children have not yet uh, gleaned some of those coping mechanisms or coping skills, as we like to say. And so for them to be impacted by trauma, you know, that certainly, if you will, not physically arrest. And we're talking about police brutality and all these other pieces that can um, impact children, but arrested psycho psychologically and emotionally. OK. And so when we talk about that, you know, we have children who experience acute trauma. There are different types of trauma. Um, acute trauma would be a sudden instance, right? And then we have chronic trauma, which is a trauma that occurs on an ongoing scale. And then we have what we would call complex trauma, which would be uh, multiple um, instances of traumatic experiences. And so when you think about children and their development, they don't have the all with all, if you will, to really uh, verbalize what that feels like. What are these feelings? How do I handle this? And so uh, in my background as a former school social worker, I would often see children and, and teachers would say maybe acting out. Of course, we know those are just the behaviors, right? We don't want to uh, put any type of pathology on that behavior, but a child's trying to figure out what to do. So you may, may see some academic problems. You may see a child more withdrawn, a child who's more isolated. Children may have psychosomatic um, concerns where maybe they, for the little ones, they say they have a tummy ache, but it's truly not a tummy ache. They just don't know how to verbalize and really express those feelings. So I think as adults, it's very critical that we're aware of how this trauma is impacting our children. Um, based on what we're seeing lately in our current society, children that may not be directly exposed to the trauma as it relates to police brutality or any other type of trauma, um, they are seeing it and witnessing it secondhand. And so that would be vicarious trauma and or secondary traumatization, which is still as impactful as, as trauma. And so we need to be mindful that uh, many young people are generally resilient. We know that's really the ability to bounce back. But then there are some children who don't have those buffers in place or those supports in place to help them bounce back in resiliency. And that's what we have to be mindful of talk about the negative impacts that trauma may have with children um, adolescents. It's very prevalent. We've got to be more mindful and intentional to support our youth as they process some of the things that they're seeing via the media and in the world that we're living in, in today. Thank you. Sure. I, I can't help but see the, the parallels between toxic stress and complex trauma. Uh, it, it see, and when you think about uh, adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma, that there seems to be quite a parallel there. Uh, Dr. Hogan, before I get to you, Dr. Cox, I'm just wondering, what are, what, are there any symptoms of adverse childhood experiences or even uh, tox, uh, toxic stress uh, that might be similar to, um, to cumulative trauma? Are there any parallels there that we can make between the two? One of the things that that often is spoken about with kids in school uh, was just mentioned, and that's acting out. And often I think acting out is just the term for when we don't know what's going on with a child. And uh, that that really is probably the first thing that that is noticed in a younger child, the inability to just kind of self-regulate. And that sets them on a path to be you know, go to the principal or go, you know, you're in trouble, your mother, we're going to talk to your mother. And then the next thing we do is suspend you. And the next thing you end up in trouble because you have time on your hands. I mean, it just is a snowball. But I think that that ability to concentrate and to self-regulate is the first thing that that occurs. Well, and, and, and you're certainly right. We, we don't think about too often um, those things of self-regulation. Those are things that we sort of take for granted that we just assume that children have the capacity to do, not understanding some of the, those uh, things that we've identified that might impact their ability to self-regulate. So um, thanks for sharing that, Dr. Cox. And again, thanks to you as well, Dr. Vetter. Moving on to uh, Dr. Hogan. Um, Moving, moving to a more of a macro lens, uh, which which to to view the division in our country uh, and the impact of the recent protests uh, happening in Portland and across the country. Dr. Hogan, as a nurse and as a community community health expert with over 20 years of experience, how will these events impact the health of our communities, and what can we do to rebuild the societal structures which have been most impacted by these these most recent events? First of all, thank you, um, Dr. Singletary. And 
Thank you to the rest of the panel. Um, I think this discussion is timely um, and so very important as we look at what's been happening for years, right? We know that, like you said earlier, the pandemic is twofold. We have two different pandemics that we're fighting right now, disease and racism. And so if we look back through the last 10 years, you look at what happened in Baltimore, you look at what happened in Ferguson, um, just recently now in Kenosha, what was with Mr. Blake, um, these horrifying images that come through the media that are streamed or, you know, recorded live, leave a horrifying impression, not just on the children, but on humanity itself. And so we look to see how can we help how can we do things differently? The first thing we need to do is identify the fact that these unrest and some of this is intentional violence stems from the health disparities that we see in our black and brown communities. Um, and so when we have the looting, when we have the fighting, when we have this civil unrest, we look to see that it not only impacts those who are supposedly it's fighting for their struggle, fighting to say what it is that they want to say and be heard. We also have to think about those pharmacies that were closed, those grocery stores that were closed. And because the black and brown community has the high disparities of things like hypertension, diabetes, asthma, we know that they can't get the medicine that they need. They can't go to the grocery store and buy the types of food that they need. And so we're left to say, what can we do? How can we stop this systemic racism that is affecting the healthcare and those? Um, I looked up several different things. And one of the things that struck me the most um, is a quote from Dr. King. Um, the quote said, um, of all the forms of inequality and injustice in the healthcare system is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Um, as healthcare providers, we have to take the charge to make a difference, right? Every time there's a, a, a shooting, um, every time there's some type of unrest, there's always a group that comes out and says, oh, let's make a change, let's do something different, and that's great, and we do so, we organize and we get together, and then once the steam or the momentum or the media coverage goes away, it seems that the type of care goes away. And I think that as healthcare providers, we need to take the charge to not to be afraid to go into community, to have panel discussions like this, to have those hard discussions, to ask those questions that we may not want to have, you know, know the answers to. And so that when we start with an open and honest dialogue, we can identify the gaps in our healthcare, we can identify um, the structures that are in place and then help to continue to make them work so that our narrative doesn't become stagnant and that in another two days, three days, four days, we are left again with another shooting, another incident, another time where we're asking why. May I add something, Dr. Singletary? Absolutely, I was gonna open up to the floor, any responses? Yeah, so just to add on to that, I think as a, university that focuses solely on health professions, it's important that we identify and talk about racism as a public health crisis, because that's what it is. And I think Absolutely. people sometimes are not familiar with the literature, the research that shows that that is indeed the truth, that all things being equal, that race and ethnicity um, has a negative impact on a person's health. And so I, I, I believe strongly that we at Chamberlain need to continue to focus on that and make sure we don't have any students leave any of our programs not fully understanding this, the science behind that and the importance of our roles as advocates. And Dr. Singletary, to add, and to add to that, I just also wanted to add, so what both of uh, the colleagues just shared, that's an example of historical trauma. And so I love, you know, Dr. Cox's um, example of that as well as uh, Logan's talk about historical trauma, that in itself lends itself to complex trauma. 
right? And so we talk about intergenerational trauma and we talk about structural violence, all those concepts. Um, if you take it out of the abstract, people live that every day, particularly those individuals who are in marginalized communities. And so I think it's very important, as was said, as healthcare professionals, whether that's nurses, doctors, psychologists, social workers, counselors, we have to work together to have these conversations to work uh, from a multidisciplinary framework to address the populations that we serve because historical trauma is real and we're, we're living that and we're seeing that, you know, in our world today. So thank you. I had a question for Dr. Davis. One of the things when you talked about the training and um, that the lack of, of training across the board that's consistent one of the things I often think about when I watch these events on TV, and granted, you only see a part, part of it, but is it just that we don't have the right professions working together? I, I Some of those cases, I think to myself, if that would have been a police officer and a social worker going together to address some of these things, you've got the best of both important worlds. And I'd just be interested in your view on that. Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I had that as part of my um, initial response and I kind of shortened it up a little bit uh, when I started hearing about some of our time constraints. So, um, but yeah, so that's, uh, there is a, a movement out there to consider um, the use of social workers um, along with police. And um, I, I mean, I, I understand and uh, on many levels, I, I can see the, the rationale there uh, from, a, from a logistical perspective that doesn't really coincide with the defund or reallocate funds away from the police uh, because to do that it would require actually additional uh, additional funding um, and then there's you know then there's the whole issue of when we receive a call for a person in distress in some kind of a crisis uh, the information that the dispatcher receives and then that we receive as as uh, uh, police officers is so scant it's hard to it's hard to know what the situation is we're going into so uh, you know, do we have a social worker riding with a police officer full time? Are they on standby at a precinct or a station and, you know, need to get picked up or drive separately to the, so there's a lot of logistical issues that um, if we could work out, I think it could be a very good model, but I, I'm, I don't think we're really very close to figuring out how to make it work, if that makes sense. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Davis, if it's okay with the panel, if I can add, I love that framework and just, you know, Telling it back for a school social worker, you know, we often accompany our school resource officers, obviously very different in the sense of not policing the community, but trying to support our children and families who were most at need. And so you had law enforcement working very closely with the school system to accompany on visits and um, really to be a buffer, to really look at the full framework, to provide community support. So I think that's best practice. And I love that we're having the conversation because forensic social work um, is certainly an area of social work. And I think there would be a great um, partnership for community collaboration across the board. And again, not just for social work, but some schools have done that very seamlessly. So I think that would certainly be um, great room for further discussion as we look at it on a broader, more macro issue um, for community policing. Yeah, and I think that that school partnership, I think, could serve as a as a good good model, um, and then I think we could translate a lot of that into um, community uh, policing um, as well. Um, but the, again, a lot of work needs to be done. There are some major differences between the two, but I think there's a lot of value in exploring um, that as a possibility. Uh, Dr. Davis, um, as you were talking, I was reflecting back on a prior conversation we had just prior to recording uh, when Dr. Cox and I were talking about running and how it's so terrible for your knees. And we were talking about uh, self-image and those things. I was thinking about the death of uh, Ahmaud Aubrey and how for me, you know, all the other deaths that had, that had taken place and somehow in my mind, I was able to think about it. Well, if, you know, if I'm being completely honest, well, this person perhaps maybe not have resisted arrest so much that, you know, maybe things wouldn't have escalated and got and, and went and went to that, that that location or went there. But with, with Aubrey's death, it was different because this was a guy who was jogging and I'm, a, I'm an avid runner. And that really um, sort of made me sort of pause and think about uh, myself and, and my self-image and how others view me. And it, got, it had me thinking as I run through my neighborhood, I was reflecting on conversations when others would stop me and ask me, 
hey, are you a football player? Are you a basketball player? And I'm like, I'm in my mid 40s. I don't think I'm doing any of that stuff right now. But what it did, it made me think about how I view myself and how others view me. I view myself as an educated African-American male, but others don't view me that way, right? When I'm not in that context. And so it really got me thinking about how I view myself and how others view me in that gap between the two. And so I wonder when you think about like police officers and law enforcement uh, and training and how much training is being done to help with those views and those perspectives of, of people of color, uh, particularly those who might be a little, a little on the larger side like myself. Um, again, because I view myself as an as a African-American educated man, but no one else seemed to do that outside of my, outside of my house when I'm going for a jog. No one sees my degrees I have. Mm -hmm. I'm just a black guy, right? And so that that was awake, That was an awakening moment for me. Uh, I just wonder if there are any thoughts on that because it was something that sort of surfaced recently for me um, as I was having conversations with my neighbors and um, about who I was and I, I the variance and the difference between who I am and who they thought I was. It was it was quite a distance apart. Yeah, uh, unfortunately for me, I don't often get mistaken for a football player, a basketball player, um, or even um, highly educated when I'm out running. But uh, uh, maybe I can change that. Uh, you know, we do um, we do receive some training. Um, again, initial training in the police academy that addresses this. Um, but again, I, it, probably not near enough. I would love to see. Um, and I've even talked with um, legislators in my state about uh, mandating additional crisis intervention training, uh, additional, um, you know, mental health, um, you know, awareness training. Um, and I, quite honestly, we didn't get much in terms of, you know, uh, dealing with, um, you know, diversity or people that don't look like us and the attitude uh, or the perception that they may have uh, of us in viewing them. So. I mean, I think there's room, uh, there's you know, plenty of room for improvement there. Um, so those are all, you know, really good points. Thank you. Moving to you, um, Dr. Hogan, I have a question for you. Um, as I mentioned in the opening, America is, is in the midst of balancing both a, pa uh, a public health and a racial pandemic, as, as you were just alluding to as well. Uh, based on reports, the impact of this devastation appears to be more pronounced in lower SES, social economic status in, in black and brown communities. Uh, what advice would you give to those who are uh, most impacted uh, and those who are most at risk of exposure to both COVID and racial injustice uh, from a community health perspective? You know, what would you do to improve both? Well, I think the first thing uh, we need to do is listen to the experts, right? We know that hand washing, staying safe, keeping yourself away from others when you're sick, you know, the stuff that they're, you know, they're constantly telling us on the TV. But I also think we also need to continue to focus on improving the health disparities because part of the reason why this community is so plagued by COVID, because we don't know a lot, everything about COVID, but the things we do know about COVID will tell us that it affects people who have pre-existing conditions, you know, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, et cetera. So as long as we are still active in our community and still saying, let's eat right, let's exercise, even in this pandemic, there are things that we can do um, to help um, continue to fight with the health disparities and then also listen to our recommendations of staying healthy, getting enough rest, wearing our mask, washing our hands. Um, I think that um, as we continue to, um, you know, work to try to find the best practices as we move forward with this COVID um, is we need to, you know, look at our national and our local leaders and, you know, press them as healthcare providers, press them, you know, remain active, be a voice, um, you know, no plug for nurses, but we are the most trusted profession. So I think we should take that and, you know, use it and for our advantage for our patients and they trust us and have us be a forefront a leader you know um that's the one thing i love about working at chamberlain we are always pushing things forward and we're always trying to find ways to you know go out in the healthcare, go out and you know in the world and and be a beacon of hope and light for the, for our patients because that's who we serve 
many children in the, in the U.S. are impacted by trauma? And from a resource perspective, how can we support children who are exposed to trauma? Dr. Singletary, so that's a great a great question. So uh, we do know that at least uh, 25 percent of our children by the age of 16 had experienced at least one traumatic event. And so that information is from our Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration statistics. Uh, we do know that children who are in more marginalized communities, particularly children of color, may be exposed to more traumatic events than their peers. And so we know that trauma is prevalent and trauma is something that certainly impacts the lives of our young people. Um, I do want to add in regard to resources, uh, I'm such a big advocate for trauma-informed practices um, across the health professions, uh, changing the organizational culture, and having a focus to recognize that trauma is real. Uh, be in a position to recognize trauma, realize that it exists, but we've got to be able to respond uh, to trauma. And so organizations really should um, and best practice adopt a trauma-informed uh, approach, uh, particularly our school systems, our health uh, care uh, systems, and so forth in order to uh, address trauma. Uh, because we can't do this in isolation. You know, I always tell those that I work with, we don't do this um, in an island unto ourselves. And so we've got to have good intentions. And intentions uh, and processes are only as good as implementation. And so best practice does say that trauma-informed uh, works. Um, and those resources for children could also be providing, as Dr. Cox mentioned, being able to address the sensory and self-regulation. And so you can go and do uh, art therapy, music therapy, play therapy, mindfulness, uh, other things of that sort that would work for children, uh, specific um, age range that would support them in addressing their trauma. And of course, counseling services by licensed professional. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Battle. And this has been a great discussion and really appreciate everyone's perspective and different views. And as was said earlier, one of the things that's important to us at Chamberlain is ensuring that we're looking at all of these issues and dealing with them head on. So I couldn't be more proud of this panel and wanna thank Dr. Singletary for his leadership and we'll leave it there. Thank you.